Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning catastrophes, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their very core basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. I'd like to welcome back one of our most popular past guests this week, Megan Gorman. Hi, thanks for having me back on. Pleasure. Megan is the founder and managing partner of Checkers Financial Management, a female-owned high net worth tax and financial planning firm. Her clientele ranges from entrepreneurs to corporate executives to people with inherited family wealth. Previously, she held vice president positions at Goldman Sachs and BNY Mellon. She's a Forbes senior contributor writing on the intersection of wealth and has been frequently quoted in such media outlets as the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, CNN, and U.S. News. Megan can also be heard regularly on the So Money podcast and, of course, on WealthManagement.com Celebrity Estates podcast. She's the author of The Wealth Intersection, a personal finance blog, and hosts The Wealth Intersection, Your Money Story Life on Voice America. She serves on the advisory board of Sway, with two A's, a digital production for women. Thanks for coming back on again, Megan. I'm thrilled to be here, and we're going to be talking about one of my favorite musicians, Prince. I'm glad you said that he's one of your favorites, because, you know, he's one of mine, too. And honestly, he's, I think, a lot of people's, right? This is, we're finally going to tackle, he's, I think, the single most requested celebrity since the show's inception. Oh, wow. Um, So the pressure's on. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. With that in mind, I'm going to immediately spin off on on a completely useless tangent. Okay, um, let's do it. Because me and my wife, we, we love Prince a lot. And uh, so <laughs> we have a thing we do whenever we meet someone from the Twin Cities area. The first question we always ask them is just, have you met him? And it's worded just like that. And so not only does everyone immediately know who him is without us telling them, but they, everyone has a story. So now how true any of those stories is, is, you know, off of a debate, but that's all kind of adds to the you know, Prince's like cockamamie mystique he has. Yeah, I'd always heard he could be seen roller skating or riding a bike around town, like randomly. And so it doesn't surprise me that people have stories. So I have uh, one silly one I'm going to share, and then we'll get back to the business. But uh, one of my, we asked this to one of my wife's college friends. Uh, apparently his dad actually managed Prince early on in his career, right when he started to blow up. And uh, oh, so wow. Prince and Michael Jackson were becoming huge solo artists at like roughly the same time, the late 70s, early 80s. So it obviously it just made sense to try to get them in the studio together for an album, and that actually happened. Um, you know, them being in the same studio, but not the album. Um, and why didn't, you know, if they were in the studio, why did the album not happen? Well, apparently there was a ping pong table in the room during that session. And Michael Jackson apparently fancied himself like an excellent table tennis player. He was like very proud of his table tennis skills. And he challenged Prince, and Prince accepted. And anyone who's seen Chappelle's show already knows Prince is a surprisingly exceptional athlete. And he beat Michael Jackson very badly, supposedly, in this, in this game of ping pong. <laughs> and so he beat him so badly that, that Jackson's like, feelings were hurt. Apparently, he was like, very invested in his, his ping pong skill. And he stormed out of the studio. So what would have been a legendary team up between sort of the two biggest artists of the day and like all time almost basically fell apart over a game of ping pong. A complete missed opportunity. <laughs> but yet what, to have seen that game, it would have been amazing, especially since both of them, I'm assuming, were out there strutting their stuff. Neither of them yeah. were shy men yeah. when it came oh, to I'm perform. They were both wearing platform heels and stuff while this was happening. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. so, I mean, now that I've just taken us completely off the rails, um, let's try to bring it back to the sure. estate. Uh, sure. Prince Rogers Nelson's death of a fentanyl overdose at age 57 on April 21st, 2016 notably without a will, created one of the largest and most complicated probate court proceedings in Minnesota history. In addition to his legendary home, Paisley Park, and his worldly possessions and liquid cash, there's also the question of royalty rights to his music, both what's been released and to the contents of a vault supposedly stuffed with unreleased recordings he made throughout his life. 
the value of his Rockstar's estate, which is estimated at a minimum 100 million, but likely much higher, is still being hashed out in Carver County Probate Court and is waiting for a determination from the IRS that's supposedly coming out this summer. But given the lockdown, obviously, that's, that's probably not a realistic deadline anymore. On Prince's death, a flurry of potential heirs looking to cash in came out of the woodwork, from hawksters to ex-business associates to alleged love children. Ultimately, it's boiled down to six siblings, uh, one full sibling and five half siblings, and now it's down to four half siblings, uh, because I believe at the end of February, one recently passed away. Um, and I've, so I've kept this story pretty simple for a few reasons here. Uh, Prince's estate is so complicated that it kind of touches on basically every issue that can come up in an estate conflict. So this is probably not the only episode we're going to devote to it. And second, it's been about a year since this podcast started airing, and that's a milestone I frankly never thought we'd hit. And in that time, we've covered a ton of topics, and we've created a fairly intimidating backlog with no real obvious jumping in point for new listeners. I'm hoping to use this episode as that jumping in point. So instead of going deep on a single aspect of Prince's estate, Megan and I are going to have a broader discussion about what exactly an estate plan is, spoiler alert, it's not just a will, and how all advisors and financial planners have important roles to play in creating and maintaining such a plan. Done correctly, it's not just a job for lawyers. So with all that in mind, and me almost out of breath, whenever most people think of estate planning, if they think of it at all, they think of a will. Megan, do you mind giving us a quick overview of what a will is and why it's important? Sure, sure. I mean, to put it quite simply, a will is a legal document that puts forth your wishes regarding the distribution of your property and who will care for your minor children. And it's that straightforward when you're defining it. But a will, to some degree, is really about dead hand control, having a say from beyond the grave on how you want things to play out. And I think when we look at the Prince estate, I think that what's so clear to so many of us who are practitioners is we don't see that dead hand control. We don't see someone sort of saying, this is what I want to have happen. And when you have an estate as complex as Prince, right, some of the things that you think about from distribution, it's not just who inherits Paisley Park or who inherits the the musical rights, but What about his name and his likeness? So as the asset bases get more complex, and particularly with celebrities who have financial setups like Prince, there's a lot to control and a lot that we probably are surprised that he did not want to control from beyond the grave. Yeah, absolutely. The the will is is more than, I mean, it's, it's who gets my stuff, right? But it can be so much more than that because the definition of stuff, the technical legal term I'm using right now, is (laughs) has become broader and broader as as time has gone on, especially now in this the information age, right? Where what can used to just be here's my chair and my baseball glove, and now it's the idea of well, you can make a hologram of me in the future. (laughs) You know, you can get money from that. Right. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is we're talking about the basics here. So most people, you know, the average American does a will. But, you know, a lot of more wealthy individuals or certain states, because I'm sitting here today in the state of California, don't do a complete, just don't just do a will, they do a revocable trust. And that is a very similar document that allows for the disposition of assets. But the beauty of the revocable trust setup is when you use it, you get privacy. And I bring this up here because I think that there's often confusion between the will and the trust. I run into it a lot in California. In California here, we all have wills, but our wills are three or four pages that basically says anything that was left out of the trust, move into the trust. The trust will control the disposition of my assets. You you mentioned privacy here, and um, you didn't say the word probate, but that's what we're talking about. So do you mind just talking about probate and what it is for people who may not know? In terms of the basic terms of estate planning, when we hear the word probate, What we're talking about is typically a judicial process where a will can be proved in court, okay? And that that happens all the time. When you think about the Jackie Kennedy Onassis estate, I remember when her will was probated. This also happened recently with her sister, Lee Radzivel. But probate can also be a process when the decedent has not left an estate plan. And that means that it's up to the courts to determine 
who gets the assets? And if they have children, who is to be the guardian of the children? Yeah, and the big point here is that probate is a public proceeding. So it necessitates sort of a public declaration effectively of all of your assets for it, for it to process. All. So all the assets in your estates become public. Um, and a lot of people, you know, that's that's the privacy issue that, that Megan's talking about. That that's really is anathema to a lot of people's interests. And, and trusts, uh, the revocable trust here passes outside probate. So the idea is that since it doesn't pass through probate, there's nothing in the estate. So nothing gets disclosed. The trust still kind of does the same function. It just cuts out the middleman of having the court proceeding of the public court proceeding is the important part. Right. And I think in the in a perfect world, right, if we were sitting here and Prince was in front of us today, I think most practitioners would advise him to do the trust route, to provide himself some privacy. And, you know, when you think about Prince as an individual and you can go back and look at his whole career to some degree, he was a very mysterious figure to all of us. So the fact that he didn't want to have privacy at his death is sort of in, in conflict of, with who he is as an individual. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is really important in estate planning is understanding that when you get a will or you get a trust, part of that process is in working with an attorney over the long term. And so when I was doing some research on Prince and understanding who he was from a more legal standpoint, it was noted numerous times in a lot of the legal proceedings he had in the um, early 2000s and, and the 2010s with Warner that he changed attorneys constantly. And so I bring this up because I think the ability to have the basics of a strong estate plan really is important to have consistency of advice. And so I wonder here, you know, with him changing attorney so much, he was not getting consistency of advice. So that might have deterred him from having an estate plan. But I think when we're working with clients, this is one of those things to be on the lookout for, for someone who changes advisors frequently, because I think it's important to make it clear to them that on certain things like litigation, you might need to change your attorney. But for estate planning, consistency is key particularly as your asset base grows, because these are complex situations. Absolutely. And we can even take that back a step and saying it's just important to know consistently in, in the team and in knowing who your client's advisors are. You have to know who they are first to even know that they're switching them all the time. You know, So like, that's the very basic step is that this is a team sport, estate planning, right? It's not just throw it to the lawyer and then everyone steps away. It's, you know, there's a, there is an information gap depending on who the client is and depending on how many advisors they have. You know, the lawyer, the estate planning attorney is frankly is unlikely to be the one who ends up with the most information about the client. You know, that's probably the financial advisor or someone who's more on the front lines of seeing them on a, on a day-to-day or week-to-week basis. So it's very important for the team of advisors to have consistency as well in working together and in knowing that each other even exist. Correct. And I think, you know, when you have a situation where, you know, Prince's estate plan, you know, I, I try to put myself in his shoes because um, he did have a child, but his child passed away. Um, and he was divorced. So to some degree in putting together an estate plan, whether it's a will or a trust requires us to do some deep, deep searching. Right. And I think for people who have children, it's a lot more obvious who you want your assets to go to. And when I've thought about Prince and I say, this as someone who doesn't have children, I think that part of his challenge with wanting to have an estate plan may have centered around the fact that he had no obvious beneficiaries. And David, you said at the beginning of this podcast, you know, what has been determined by the court is that he has one full sibling and five half siblings who are going to be his beneficiaries. And so, you know, the the question is, would that have been what he would have wanted if he really had a say? And so he lost that control. But I think some of that stemmed from the fact that sometimes it's not so obvious who you want to have get your money. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, it's important to look at the laws here. A lot of times in intestacy law was mm-hmm. sort of as you know, outdated as a lot of laws are. It, it's really built with like the traditional like 1950s, like nuclear family in mind, where it works if you have kids, you know, 1.5 children who you trust and you want them to have everything or if you want it to go back to your parents. Um, but in sort of obviously the modern world, as Prince, who's a divorced man with a deceased child and then four step siblings and one you know, full sibling 
and all these things. And he's very religious. So who knows how much, you know, his church was his chosen family. You know, these things are, you know, say, you know, in a, to give a different example, someone in the LGBTQ community who maybe doesn't have children and has, you know, a larger group of, of friends who, who are their chosen family, who they maybe are closer to than their own biological family. And the law doesn't, you know, left alone, the law doesn't really allow for these um, complexities and these sort of subtle interactions to happen. You have to lay this stuff out. First, you have to find out about it, and then you have to, like, craft the plan to reflect what this person actually wants to happen. Well, and I think what happens here in the Prince estate plan is really important for advisors to understand because it, it, re it requires us to push harder on our clients. So as we said, you know, one of his siblings and his half siblings inherited um, the estate, but interesting, one of his half siblings ended up um, passing away. But before he passed away, he made a decision to sell his share of or sell a, a number of his rights in his share of the Prince estate to an entertainment company. And this entertainment company does a number of things. I know they just bought air supplies, music rights. They were involved with the Whitney Houston estate. And in particular with the Whitney Houston estate, they were involved with the idea of putting a hologram of her on tour. So why I bring this up is there are unintended consequences for failing to have a will. Prince may have wanted his half sibling to inherit the estate. That might have been within his wishes. But if we had him here today and we said, do you want to, your rights, your, your name, your likeness, your share in that being sold to a company that could put you on stage as a hologram, I think he'd probably cringe, especially since when you go back and look at Prince's legal history, he did things other artists never did. Um, he, there was a very famous case in 2007 with YouTube where he shut down a woman who put a 30 second video up of her daughter dancing, her little baby daughter dancing to Let's Go Crazy. So I can't imagine he would have wanted these unintended consequences. I mean, this is the man who changed his name to a unpronounceable symbol to, you know, to sidestep the record company having too much control of him. So, you know, it's definitely something, the idea of a hologram, I think would, would drive him completely insane. Exactly, exactly. But and I think also, you know, we're, we're trying to do what Prince wanted, right? You're trying to do what the decedent wanted, but you've also got to, you know, as, the, as Prince, you have to think about the best interest also of your beneficiaries, right? Now, you know, we're making this, we're kind of villainizing um, his step-sibling who died because, you know, he sold these rights to this, you know, so maybe a little bit shady entertainment concern. But I think, I believe none of his step-siblings who stand to inherit here are under age 58. So you have to realize, like, now he's created a situation where you have much older people who likely want to see this money at some point while they're still alive. Right. And so now they're put in a position where they have this thing hanging over their head as well, and they don't know what to do with it. So right. it's, it's as much as, you know, you want to control your things yourself and for your own benefit. You know, I think also Prince cared about his beneficiaries. Most people care about their beneficiaries and they want to put them in the best position as well. And so that's right. just another interesting wrinkle here of not having this plan. Well, and I think that that brings up another issue here, right? Which is when you don't have a will or a trust, you know, you're, you're sort of letting things happen. So, you know, what, what some of the beneficiaries have expressed frustration with is, I think they've gone through two corporate trustees at this point. They've paid, you know, over 10 million to attorneys. Um, I think that there's been another 35 million in expenses, getting valuations and gathering assets and selling things. And on top of that, there have been estate taxes. So, the question you have to ask yourself as a practitioner is when, when you're sitting in front of the client and they're being resistant to doing an estate plan, to actually putting it on paper, you have to lay out to them, okay, there's a lot of unintended expenses that will happen if you don't take the right steps. So the first thing is, you know, should Prince have been you know, should his estate have paid as much estate tax as it did? Now, he paid both a federal estate tax, um, he's paying a federal estate tax and a Minnesota estate tax, because Minnesota has an estate tax. And the question is, were there ways that that could have been mitigated? And I think all of us know that there are, but you have to be willing to go into that type of estate planning. I think, you know, by going without a will, the cost of probate to get valuations, to get everything worked out, has just been exorbitant. And I think this is very draining on the ultimate beneficiaries who, based on what has been said in the press, some of them were pretty desperate to get liquidity. These were not wealthy people on their own. 
And all of a sudden they're being flung into an estate that's worth somewhere between 200 and 300 million dollars. And yet they've got no liquidity. Yeah, it, it's very interesting that these sort of things happen. And we, we're talking about you know cost here. In the case of someone who's as wealthy as Prince, um, it's very much a monetary cost. Um, but even if your clients are not particularly wealthy, I mean, if they, you know, estate tax, it's something like if they're under 10, 11 million dollars with 22 million for a couple, you don't need to worry about it. But there's still a cost to letting things through, even if you're not paying the, the, the fees for estate tax. There's still an emotional cost of you know the fights that could have been presented or could have, if not pre- prevented, then at least shortened or cut off a little bit by having this plan in place. So there, there's both, you know, there's, and there'll still be lawyer's fees a lot of times for those, which will be and more reasonable, but again, to within people's means, it's probably they don't want to spend that money. So you know, there are a number of costs for high net worth clients. It's you're really more worried, you know, a lot of times about this monetary cost. But for for more normal, typical clients, it's there's a high emotional cost at stake. Completely, completely. And I think if we think of some of the other basics that the Prince Estate Plan missed is beyond not having a will or a trust, and and everything's in the public space, and there's these tax issues is he didn't name anyone to administer his estate. And I think when we're working with clients, picking an executor um, is probably one of the most important decisions because this is the person who is appointed to administer the estate. And a lot of the costs that happened out of the gate with the Prince estate was there was no administrator. So they had to figure out who it was going to be. And I believe this is where they've picked a corporate to step in. Um, whether that was something Prince would have wanted, it's not clear. But again, there was no, he did not put the estate in a place where he could have someone representing his wishes in the way he wanted them to be carried out. Yeah, and this idea of picking an executor and how important that is, it's easy to understate and it's easy for clients to not quite gather. Because I think a lot of people are just thinking like, oh, it's who I trust the most. And like, yeah, it is who you trust the most. But so, you know, if they're say, oh, I trust Uncle Bob. But if Uncle Bob is just some guy and you've got a fairly complicated estate that now he's in charge of, you know, he's just not qualified to do that. Even if you trusted him a lot, he doesn't have the ability to do a good job. And he's, you know, he's, he's not going to want to let you down, but he, you know, he ultimately may just because it's beyond him. And so that's where sort of this idea of picking an advisor or a professional or, you know, or a corporate, as you said, um, are all options that exist, even if it's not like your trustworthy family member, but it's someone who has the expertise to actually handle things when they, when they happen. Right. And I think when you are working with clients, particularly, you know, sophisticated clients like Prince, you have to ask the follow-up questions when you get them to pick the executor. Why did you pick this person? Why do you think they, they would do a good job? Do they have the time to do this, right? Do they have the savviness to know when they will need help? Um, I think a lot of the follow-up questions when you pick an executor is key. And then it's also, you know, who is the backup to the executor if the executor can't do it? Um, Making sure those key provisions that are are in a a will so that someone is there who really can handle the gravitas of being an executor. Yeah, estate plan definitely has an element of sort of like a a pre-flight checklist, right? I love that. Like we need two of everything just in (laughs) case something breaks. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think when you think about if when you think about the situation, it just seems so frustrating that Prince just sort of missed all these sort of obvious things that he should have been doing. And I think, Um, you know, we say obvious because we're professionals, right? And and, then we can see them and we look at them. But you know, it may not be obvious to him. And that's why I think that the follow up questions that you just mentioned are such a like very important part of this process. That's for all advisors. Because, you know, Prince, or in this case, you know, or any client, you know, they may have things that in hindsight came up that were so obvious and so easy to cut off. But, you know, in the moment when they were even thinking about the plan, they might not have even known themselves that XYZ was important to them or what was going on or that they may have known about something but not thought it was important to tell their lawyer, you know, but maybe they thought it was important to tell their financial advisor. So it's, this is where that communication comes back in and asking, it's all in these follow-up questions is where you find these things. Where like at the end of the day, you look at it and you're like, well, how are we supposed to know that this was going to happen? Well, it's like, well, if everyone has follow-up questions and we all share, uh, all on the team share that information with each other, there's going to be much fewer things that just come up and we're like, how are we possibly supposed to know that? Right. And I think one of the biggest challenges, particularly with an artist like Prince, right? And I, I actually have a couple of clients who are artists is they don't see themselves as, you know, aging in the same way. They feel they're creative and 
you know, putting something on paper seems so permanent to them. And, and it feels permanent to anyone doing an estate plan. And so I think it's, it's also making it clear to them that, you know, going with the consistency that we talked about is this is a living, breathing document. And yes, you're going to put it in place, but it's not going to be in place forever because we're going to keep reviewing it. And I think when you have complex assets like Prince did, you know, the estate plan has to be a constant discussion of what's going on. Does this work? As he creates new art, how does it fit in to the overall plan? And I think it's really pushing past people who feel that I don't want to do this right now because I don't want to deal with my own mortality. I don't think Prince thought he was going to pass away at 56. Uh, I don't think any of us thought that. I mean, and Michael Jackson at 50, George Michael at 50. I mean, but again, things happen. And so it's really trying to push people, push clients to get something on paper, even if it's with the understanding that, yes, this will change. But for right now, it will give you guidance and give you dead hand control. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the fear of mortality is a very real thing that, that we have to deal with. And even once you get them to actually stop and sit down and write the will, in my personal professional experience, I've actually had a really hard time getting people to come back and sign it. Yes. Where like, it's that, like, that's the big final step. They've written the whole thing. It's just like, come back to the office and just, you know, stick your name on it. We're good. And it's like, I'll have people who just disappear. Um, because that's, for whatever reason for them, makes it too real. And you know, it sounds kind of silly to people in other professions, but, it, but like, for instance, Pablo Picasso was so freaked out by the idea of dying. He died without a will. And his reason, like, he basically didn't want to jinx himself. <laughs> was, right. <laughs> so right. it's like, it can, and, you know, that stuff is, is silly when you're thinking, you know, like a wealthier person, right? Because wealthy people are eccentric you know, instead of stupid, but it's, you know, it's what happens. And these are the sort of clients that you're going to have to deal with and massage and get them, you know, work with these feelings. And, you know, that's a lot of what estate planning is, is f figuring out these feelings and these relationships. And, and for a lot of clients, it's not so much the, well, X dollars goes here and Y dollars goes there. Yeah. You know, when I, I went back and looked at a lot of Prince's pre previous legal issues, because I was trying to see thematically, if there was a reason why he didn't do an estate plan. Because I find over time, and I think you might as well, David, that clients repeat their, their, repeat their actions again and again. Who they are consistently comes up. Um, and in reading his past legal battles, what was most interesting to me was that he was described as ferociously aggressive. And obviously you brought up the fight with Warner, um, Warner Music, where he was um, the artist formerly known as Prince and he was that sign. Um, but, you know, it, to some degree, there is part of me that wonders, you know, that aggressiveness, that sort of like, a, there was always a mischievous nature to Prince. There's a part of me that wonders, maybe he did intend this. Maybe he didn't care enough about once he was gone and didn't mind if it was chaotic because he'd be gone. I, you know, I've just tried to, and I think it's important when you're doing a client's estate plan to try to understand their nature and try in that, those times when someone seems to be wanting to, you know, swim against the tide to sort of point out to them, listen, we appreciate the fact that you want to make that impact, but ultimately for those of us left behind, it's a pretty big mess. Yeah, absolutely. And understanding the client's nature is super important. So then you can actually identify when things that are happening that are maybe not of his nature. So you can be aware of the outside pressures that are that are also on the client, maybe forcing them in a certain direction that they otherwise wouldn't be going in. We've kind of talked around it here with Prince, but you know, he did die of a fentanyl overdose. And that only came out afterwards. But how long was he, you know, that's not that's a big boy drug. That's, you know, that, that's an indicative of sort of a larger opioid crisis in this country. But, you know, how how long was that in his life? And how much was that affecting why or why he wasn't doing things? And, you know, in addition, there's, he had a very strong affiliation with the Jehovah's Witness Church. So, you know, and that's not necessarily a drug addiction, but that is another outside force that, you know, could be pushing him in certain directions that maybe are not necessarily the best for him or his um, beneficiaries. Or maybe they are, and, and that needs to be taken into account also that this is something he deeply cares about and needs to be, you know, worked in. The tragic thing about Prince is he might have wanted uh, his church, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, to receive a part of his estate and they won't now. Um, so, you know, it, it, they're an omitted beneficiary because as you pointed out, they don't fall into the laws of intestacy. So you know, we're running out of time here, Megan. And I think uh, we've gone pretty much, and there's so much more of Prince's <laughs> estate here. There, there's so much going on. Is it, 
with his legacy and, and you know, he basically built a monument to himself in Minnesota. And yet now who knows what his legacy will be. He put no planning into his legacy. He's, you know, so these sort of things seem out of case and there's just so much more to cover, but it's, I think it's just too big a topic for one episode. But I think we've done a good job of sort of laying down these um, basic ideas. And if you can, you know, if I can put you on the spot like I like to do, and if you sure. can try to encapsulate this idea of what an estate plan is in, in, in one or two sentences, um, you know, what would you say? You know, when I think of estate planning, and I work with clients on estate planning all the time, it comes back to control. It comes back to controlling how everything will flow once you're gone. And that all of us have different levels of control that we want to exercise, but this is your one chance to exercise it in the manner that is appropriate for you. And so that's sort of how I look at estate planning. And that's sort of the tragedy of the Prince estate is it's a complete lack of control. Well, thanks so much for coming back on, Megan. This has been great. Oh, no, thank you for having me. It's always fun to talk about Prince. And for our listeners, I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me on the next episode of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.